Welcome to the Swamp. It's been a long two years, but we finally have our hands on Pal World. This game has been my most anticipated game for the last several years since the original trailer, and I have got to say, it certainly holds up to my expectations, but let's get into the deep dive of Pokemon with Guns. My name is Excaligator. I rate games based on many categories that would fit into most survival games based on a 1 to 5 system. If a category does not apply, it will not affect the game's overall score. Now let us get started. So I've played this game non-stop since its release a week ago, at least up until writing this review. And while I've not yet finished the game, I have a good enough understanding to bring a review to you. I've defeated several of the tower bosses and have caught more than 100 out of the 111 pals that are at least available right now. How World is being touted as Pokemon with guns, but that's more of a meme than anything. This game, while the pals do resemble Pokemon that already exist, the game itself is more of a mix of Conan Exiles and Ark Survival Evolved, both of which I have over 2,000 hours put into those games. The idea is that you are set on a group of islands where these pals live, however, while they look cute and cuddly, they are in fact deadly. If many don't know the deeper lore of Pokemon itself, there is evidence from both the games as well as episodes that show that humans do eat Pokemon and Pokemon eat humans and even other Pokemon. Not to mention the exploitation of Pokemon, the black markets, hell does anyone remember the episode that was removed because it had a gun in it? And what about the Celebi movie with the bounty hunter who enslaved and sold Pokemon on the black market? All I'm saying is that it does exist in Pokemon and Game Freak and Nintendo never really explored the more gritty nature of the deeper lore of the games. How World decided that it would take those ideas and roll with it. While you can choose to not engage with the more gritty gameplay, you can also choose to go ham and kill everything and capture everyone, including other humans. You can enslave and work them to death, or you can take care of them and be their friends. The playstyle is completely up to you. The game runs well on a middle-of-the-road computer. I've not had any issues playing offline while in single-player mode. It is accessible for most people. However, it does require a higher-grade processor, so be wary of that. There are also some issues on the multiplayer side in terms of lag and connectivity, but we'll get to that in the lag section. Oh my god, you are anorexic. <laughs> Okay. You're literally just skin and bones. The character creator is fairly decent. While it took a lot from Craftopia with all of the player models that look like anime girls and femboys, there are at least now some masculine features, so it has been expanded and improved upon. Of course, I made my original character that I do in every game, which I wasn't able to do in Craftopia, so I was happy there. There is even body shaping. While not completely advanced, it is enough to get a bit of variety from other players. To have some monstrous fat character with the 3D model stretched out unrealistically or to a sickly looking anorexic character. I think I'm gonna rate the character creation a 4 out of 5. It could be better of course, but it's not too advanced and overall it is serviceable and not really that bad at all. The game starts off with your character waking up on the beach with three of the starter pals looking down at you curiously. Luckily, these pals don't seem to be the more aggressive ones, as when you wake up, they scurry away in fear. From there, you always start off in the same spawning location. However, if you die, you could choose between several islands that are all considered starting zones, with mostly the same pals everywhere, though some do have exclusive ones as well as some different in resources. I would say the start of this game is a bit of a slog. It's a slow burn until you eventually get into the game as you punch trees and rocks, pick up things off the ground, and have to build things yourself that take quite a while to make. But as you start to catch your first pal, and they help you build up and maintain your base, you can catch more, and the game becomes much easier over time, as well as more open to you. Just be wary of the boss battles that roam in the various starting areas. With that being said, I'm going to rate the start of the game a 4 out of 5, because while it was a bit of a slog at the start, it progressively gets much better and can really hook you in. What is that? Oh, I'm gonna fuck you up, look. Oh. Guys! Oh, look what I have. Guys! 
What did you find? I found a shiny! There is a lot to discover in this world, from various types of biomes to rare pals that can only be found in certain areas at night in caves, which also serve as dungeons, and you also have the rare shiny pals to catch. Loads of items you can just find on the ground for both resource gathering as well as progression items to collect. One of the biggest pet peeves in any video game is when an enemy spawns in the same spot every single time, and thank god this game has dynamic spawn spawning that is similar to art, which means the majority of normal creatures will spawn randomly within the various biomes that they live in, with some being more rare than others, and some only appearing at night. Now there are exceptions, there are several types of boss battles in the world, from mini bosses that are just stronger variants of already existing monsters, to some of the stronger mini bosses, which usually there are only one of them in the world, though not always the case, at least some of them. While a lot of these are found roaming in the world in certain spots with hour long respawn timers, you do have some that are in specialized instance areas. These can also be refought with an hour cooldown and are generally harder. And lastly, you have the towers, which are the actual boss battles of the game. They are like the gym trainers, who have a ton of health and hit like a truck. We can talk more about them in the PvE section. You can also find pals that fight other pals, as well as enemy humans like the Syndicate attacking the pals to kill or capture them. You can find pals roaming in smaller groups, solo or in herds. I once saw a herd of the mammoth-like pals that were just kind of chilling out near a pond, as well as another time where I saw the exact same mammoth pal, two of them in fact, and they were fighting territorially. I used that to my advantage to catch one of them while it was weakened by the other. But I also love the fact that you can find random spheres on the ground. You can pick them up, which helps give you several additional ones while you're exploring, in case you happen to find that one rare pal you've never seen before and that you want to catch. And on rare occasions, you can find ammo and chests. Chests have three different colors of rarity. Some of them, like the yellow ones, you can open up right away. Purple requires copper keys, which you find off rarer pals, and red requires a silver key, higher grade drop, better gear of course, but the silver keys drop off of mini bosses. Along with finding the resources just scattered among the ground, you can find on rare occasions fruit, which act like the Pokemon's version of TMs, and they will teach your pals abilities. The best spots to look for these are trees that are scattered throughout the world that will have about three or four trees hanging down that you can just take them with a certain amount of respawn time afterward. You also have eggs eggs that are just laying around randomly in the various biomes. Each egg have different colors, which correspond to the various types. We can talk more about these later. Enemy camps can also be found in the map, and will have various factions guarding it. Inside of these camps, you will find captured pals that you can rescue and make yours. This is a great way of finding rare pals at the start of the game, as well as rescuing them and making them your own without being violent, if you want to be the pacifist. There are friendly NPC villages too that you can visit as well. Within them you can find PAL vendors that you could buy and sell to. These same vendors can be found stationed in smaller camps around the world and sometimes even travel to your base on a super rare occasion as I've only had one traveling merchant visit my base since the start of the game. And if you look hard enough you can even find black market vendors who sell even more rare PALs. My only real gripe is that there is way too much verticality in most of the Map. While there are measures to get around it, it didn't feel as smooth as Craftopia or even a game like Bloodline. The more you progress, you can get better flying pals to bypass the terrain, and I don't really mind ground traversal, I just wish I wasn't trying to navigate it like a maze in most places, which is why I made my base on Marsh Island, because it's mostly flat. I'm gonna rate the exploration a 4.5 out of 5. It has a ton of reasons to want to explore and even continue adventuring out, even after after you've been to a location once or twice. Is it Palladium or oh, oh, Palladium? Oh, this, this is Palladium right here. It's an ore node. It was Palladium, not Palladium. It's Palladium. Is it? What is this? What is it like? No, it's Paldium. It's P-A-L-D-I-U-M. Paldium. Palladium. No, Palladium. there's no I. There's no extra eye. Palladium. Palladium. No. Oh. 
While the survival mechanics are basic and really only boil down to a food bar, you have not only one food bar, but also the pals in your inventory as well as the pals working at your base. Now it's not that bad, berries are a dime a dozen and are the best way to feed your pals, they are easy to farm, as well as harvest yourself out in the wild. However, larger pals will require more food, so you will need to make either better quality food or just more berries overall. Making larger farms, ranches for mill and honey products are a great way to do this as well. You will also not die of starvation. When you reach the hungry debuff, as well as the pals, they will only be decreased in stat. Of course, once you hit zero and starve, you will start to lose health, but it will stop at one, so you don't die, just don't get hit by anything. The progression in terms of experience to level up can be gained by doing anything, from gathering, crafting, building, killing, catching. It seems though, catching pals is the best way of gaining quick experience so far though. I'm gonna rate this a 3.5 out of 5. It's basic enough, not too hard to handle, but also not as in-depth for a survival game. Right now, I have to say the building is the weakest part of this game. While in some ways it has improved upon some of the systems from Craftopia, there are two issues that I have with that make it a deal breaker for me, and that I wish I had known before playing. First things first, the improvement. Craftopia may have tons of styles to the building and cool decorations, but placing the pieces down was an absolute nightmare that breaks too easy. Power World has improved upon placing the pieces down, at least for the most part, and it's also neatly organized in a radical wheel, which is categorized by the different types of placeables. There are a ton of decoration items, with some being useful like the storage units, but also some that are solely for looks. Now, the PAL box is something that you must have in order to make a functional base. The PAL box will have a radius around it, which controls the flow of work as well as the AI pathing of the PALs that will help you out on the base. While workbenches and other forms of crafting stations must be placed within this circle, plain building pieces for your home or defensive walls don't need to be placed within the circle, so the shell of your home can be larger than needed. However, this also leads to issues as well. Pals will not leave the circle of the box, so you have to have the box placed where they can work the most. Additionally, once the box is placed, you are discouraged from moving it as if you move it at all, any crafting bench that is required to be in the circle will disassemble. You will gain all the materials back, but it's more of a pain in the ass to rebuild it all. Another issue is that it pisses me the fuck off that I didn't know that you cannot place things in front of the box. Of course the reason is because the pals spawn in front of the box when summoned. Fair enough, but I built my home before I placed the box, and when I placed it, it was open at the time. But this led to an issue is that, firstly, when you want to upgrade your base from wood to stone for example, you cannot overlay and place it like you can in art. You have to disassemble the wood pieces and then place the stone ones. It's terrible because you cannot place floor pieces where chests or stations are, or they will disassemble too and everything will fall on the floor. And then when I went to go replace the wall next to the PAL box, even though it was out of range originally to even place the box, it was refusing to let me place the wall back. So then I had a huge hole in my wall and my base looked ugly as a result. It could not be fixed unless I moved the PAL box and rebuilt all of my stations again. There are building pieces that are also missing from the building system that should be there, like railings, pillars, corner roof pieces, and a lot of the pieces such as the roofing pieces and the staircases have terrible snapping. If I try to place a stair below a door frame where the stairs will go into the ground, 90% of the time it will not want to place. On rare occasions I have been able to place it, but generally no. So now I have foundations that are a big step up that I can't make stairs to smooth it out. Pals on your base will also get stuck often either on building pieces outside of the base ring because they went to go try to grab something and then can't find their way back into the circle, or some other method like them appearing randomly on top of a roof. It makes it so you have to put them back in the box to respawn them back or they'll just starve to death. There is also a base defense system that you will have to prepare for. As early game, it's not that bad and you can fend off the attackers fairly easy, but as you grow and progress, enemies will scale with you and become more deadly. Soon enough, I had flying beacon birds electro-zapping my whole rooftop 
and then soon after, I had a fire type pal use fire, which caught the wooden building pieces of my base on fire, burned my entire base to the ground. The larger base that you see in the footage of this video, the at least the large square-like one with the courtyard and everything, is completely gone now because it burnt to the ground. I tried to find water pals and ice pals to help put out the fire, and while they did help out, the fire was far too gone and spread out of control. It eventually destroyed my entire base down to the stone foundation that I had started to build. Even the pal box was destroyed and the pals that were working on my base had vanished. The materials as well as the pals were gone onto the floor. I managed to recover my pals and then I made a new pal box so that I could place the gathering pals who would help me clean up and salvage the material off the floor into some boxes eventually so I could rebuild. The rebuilding of course was the most annoying part but at least my supplies and materials were all recovered. Though enough of my ranting let's move on to the crafting section. So the crafting at the start is bearable for you to do alone though higher in progress you go, the longer it takes to build things. This is where your pals come in. Each pal have unique qualities that make it good at something and others not so much. Some can farm, some can transport items to your boxes, some can cook, and so on. There are also different levels to the skills. The higher the level means they can do things much better and work faster. An example is that I tried to get a level 1 pal to mine ore. It refused to do it and only wanted to mine stone, but then I put a level 2 miner out and it went straight for the ore. With longer crafting times, it becomes similar similar to Conan Exiles in the way that you can assign pals to certain benches to passively craft for you while you are out playing and exploring. Once you return, the items will be waiting for you at home. Same with any of the gathering skills. While the logging and mining camps you can create don't produce a lot per second, they passively farm while you are out exploring so you can leave, come back, and have a pal waiting for you to craft with. The pals that work hard will also tire out easy, so make sure you have food, beds, and relax taxation stations for them or they will get angry with you and refuse to work. Sometimes they can get sick. If they do get sick, you can heal them or place them back in the box to feel better over time. Though sicknesses do require medicine and won't heal by itself. Eventually, you can fully automate your systems to be hands-off, such as the farming. Now, the farming in this game is progressional. You start with berries, then you can unlock wheat. Eventually, you unlock tomatoes and lettuce and have a full-on garden. By having pals who see seed, harvest, water, and gather, you can have a fully automated farm that will keep your base workers well fed. As you level up, you can unlock items that not only add to the decoration of the base, but also increase the level of certain skills for your pals to make them more efficient. And the last thing I want to talk about is the eggs. You can find eggs out in the world that you can hatch. The bigger the egg, the better the chance at finding a rare pal. I've gotten several badass and OP pals just from random eggs I found in the world from a giant blue manticore that I named Lunestra to a samurai dude with a fire sword. This is one of the best ways to get super rare pals in the early game. There is additionally breeding where you can combine male and female to cross traits and skills between parents. Though they don't always make the same type of pal that was bred, I think the system needs a bit more refinement. Though I didn't play enough with it, so I'm not going to comment too much on the breeding system. I love the crafting of this game, but I'm going to rate this section a 3.5 out of 5 because the building issues that really dragged it down from the problems it currently has. Now these can all be added or changed with content updates but for now it's one of those things that you really need to know the issues beforehand to avoid it or you will hate it later on. Look, look at me. I just all I don't respect it. Look. Why are you shielded. holding a uh, sheep? He's a human shield. The PvE is really fun in this game. While it starts off with you just beating pals to death with a club, it eventually leads to bows, crossbows, and various forms of guns. You can fight alongside with your pals in action combat instead of turn base. Even with the action combat, you can see there was a lot of influence from Pokemon. 
Many abilities you use can easily translate to Pokemon ability, but in an open 3D environment, which makes it look and feel cooler. There are elemental strengths and weaknesses just the same. Fire is strong to grass, water is strong to fire. There are also status ailments like being paralyzed, frozen, burned, and poisoned. Hell, I've even seen flinches from crits. And while it helps if your pals tank enemies for you so you can get some hits in, you can pull aggro as a human, and you, of course, as a human, are weak to powerful fantasy creatures, so you must use your technology and reflexes to stay alive, from rolling out of the way of oncoming attacks, to making shield generators to help you take on the brunts of attacks. Now that's pretty much how the combat works, but what can you do with it? Well, besides running around and shooting random smaller pals for fun, you also have caves that serve as dungeons. Now, I've noticed between the dungeon resets, sometimes they seem to change layouts, but most of the time they are the same, across, you know, most of the caves that I've been to at least, though I could be wrong about that. I do hope that they improve the caves a little bit, make it more varied in the looks as well as the layout, though they do offer rare pallets that you can only find in caves. There is also sulfur and ore, of course randomized bosses at the end. These bosses are known as alphas, they are larger, more powerful variants of pre-existing pals that you can catch and be utilized. There are also the mini world bosses as well as the mini boss arenas, which also have alpha versions of pals as well as rare and unique pals, which I've mentioned before in the video. I seem to notice that the arena fights are much harder than the ones in the world, and they're much harder to catch as well. And of course, lastly, you have the towers, which are like the gym battles. They are the toughest opponents in the game, which require almost a type of strategy to defeat. Like when I fought Zoe and Grisbolt, I had to circle out my pals as they got low health. Your pals will recover health if they are inside of their ball, so long as they're not dead. So by cycling them, by the time I get back to them, they would have most of their health back to keep fighting. I also use a lot of ground type abilities like the turtle guy who slapped the shit out of her and was also quite tanky. You do still have to be careful when you are in the wilds though, because even though let's say you are a higher level than the biome that you are currently wandering around in, including the level of the creatures around in that area, if there are a lot of them in one place, they will slap the shit out of you. As pals can call friends to help them, Gobfins are one of these. They have a high aggro range and will form a group of like 10 or so to gang on you. Going back to the base raid for a moment, I'm not quite sure what they prioritize as I've had them just run into my base and stand there before before engaging in combat. Now, they can attack your building pieces, defense walls, and even your pals. Your pals will help you fight them off, so you don't really have to worry about being outnumbered most of the time. Eventually, you can build stations for pals to defend the base, such as mounted machine guns and rocket launchers. Though, they didn't really seem to work for me, as I've had pals stationed in them, and they just kind of stand there and do nothing, even when the enemy is right in front of them, attacking them, and attacking the walls. So that was kind of a disappointment on my end. I don't know if mine were just bugged, or... If if it's just not fully functional and of course as I mentioned in my rant earlier you do have to be wary of wooden structures that can catch fire even from your own pals though with the few nitpicks I just said overall I'm gonna write the PVE a 5 out of 5 it is really fun and the action combat feels really good I'm going to be skipping the PvP section as there is currently no PvP in the Early Access game. However, the devs have stated that they plan to add it later on before or by the launch of the full-on game. So for now, we're going to leave this blank. This game as of right now doesn't seem to have an overall story. You start off in the world and are given the goal to defeat the towers. Of course, there are logs you can find for background lore to the game, but for now, I'm not going to rate the story section as an overall because it's possible that more could be added later on, including an overall story. So we're just going to wait into the next review to rate this section. As of right now, there are no official mods for Power World. However, that won't be the case for very long, as the devs have stated that they are open to mods and will embrace them by the time the game releases. They just need a little bit more time to provide the dev kit in order for fans to make their own mods for the Steam Workshop page. Though that has not stopped some, as there was, I shit you not, a mod already within a day of the launch 
for Pal World to replace all of the NPCs and players with a Pokemon skin. It looked absolutely hilarious, especially when you see Misty pull out a giant ass gun. Though the mod was taken down within less than 24 hours, and any footage of that mod is getting flagged for copyright, so I cannot show it to you here. Though I'm sure you can also find mods on third person websites for now until the official ones are ready. For now, I'm not going to rate this section, though I suspect in the future when I review it at launch it could possibly be a 5 out of 5 with how much creativity as well as hype is around this game what what are you doing i, I don't know help what do you mean help <laughs> Speaking of hype, as I am writing this review, this game has sold over 5 million copies or even more by the time this video comes out, with more being sold every day. This game has already a decent amount of interest from the initial trailers from the last couple of years, but via word of mouth, and it has exploded into unheard levels of hype and fandom to over millions of people playing at the same time, and has broken Steam records. With that, of course, there is now a greater chance in the rise of so-called haters. If there was a reason to hate this game, fair enough. However, most of from what I've seen are people who either are just anti-trend, Pokemon fans who hate other creature capture games that are not Pokemon, as well as vegans and PETA. Oh, of course, you also have the radical Western Gen Zers who hate this game because of slavery or some bullshit. Like, come on, guys, it's a quirky sandbox game. You don't have to engage with anything like that, and even if you do, it's a game. It's fake. Get over it. Though, moving past that, the Moving past that, we do know that the game plans to be built on for the next year or two until it is fully realized into the official launch. The devs have confirmed that they want at least 150 pals, you know, just as the original Pokemon game was, though at the moment we only have 111 to find, so that leaves plenty of room for new and unique pals, though I got something to say about that in a moment. People have stated that the criticism of the publisher have also been abandoning their earlier games, such as Craftopia, which has been in early access for many, many years. Now, they do have a point with the older games that are abandoned, but for Craftopia, a year ago, I would have believed you, but given their recent open world update, as well as several huge updates since I last reviewed it a few months ago, I say the game is not abandoned. It was delayed for a good reason, being a restructure of the whole game. It makes sense. They are still working on it, though, so I'm not gonna let that tell me how Pal World will turn out. The Pal World devs are also very active in the community, especially in Discord and Twitter. They love to host Q&A sessions and have even allowed fans to name several of the pals themselves. They just recently posted their roadmap for the future of the game. Either way, I'm gonna say the success and decent enough track record will bring the score to a 4 out of 5. I only dropped it a point because it is still a fresh early access launch, so we don't have concrete evidence or a stance on the updates just yet. Uh, now he's flying. You see him? What? Don't worry about it. He is fine. <laughs> he is not fine. He's fine. Shut up. Of course, as any early access game, there are still a lot of kinks to work out. I've already mentioned that the base building is still scuffed, along with the pals getting stuck on things. Sometimes you can see a seam up in the skybox. While I've not crashed so far, I seem to only hit a lag or rubber banding while playing online with other players. Offline, I have no issues running the game at all and have always ran at 60 FPS. Though with that being said, there seems to be a lot of issues with the online servers and connection. While I've not seen these issues myself, it seems to be a big enough issue that the devs have been working on it for the last few days to a week. The larger issue being a black loading screen that never ends. While turning on the game itself, I do have a black screen for about 5 seconds, but it moves on after that. Other people have not been so lucky, and will have the black screen for 5 minutes or longer, from both turning on the game to also just loading into a dedicated server. I'm not really going to mention the overloading of servers because that was to be expected with the amount of hype that has already been generated, not to mention the jump since launch. But yeah, overloaded servers are a big issue and they are trying to work that out with the server providers. I will say the score for this section is going to be a 4 out of 5 because yes, it has issues, 
but I never had anything game breaking and most of the harsher issues are from online server connectivity which can be avoided on non-dedicated servers or solo play. My overall score for Pal World is going to be a 4.1 out of 5. My only gripes are the building issues, and I feel that there are way too many variants. I would be okay with variant pals as shinies of the, you know, various pals out in the world, but the variants themselves take up a numbered spot in the pal decks, and I feel it's just filler when those spots could be used for more creativity and different kinds of pals. Though, with that being said, I am glad to say that my expectations were met with this game, and I have been following it for several years now since the first trailer. I have had it listed in my most anticipated game. With very few issues so far, it can only get better from here with few Future updates. And that is the end of this video. If you liked my review, please subscribe to this channel as I will be making more in-depth reviews of open world sandbox survival RPG games, including those that no one ever talks about from the deepest, darkest depths of Steam. Some games that even look like the muck at the bottom of my pond. If you have any suggestions for what game to do next, please comment below and like this video. Florida Gator Man out. Actually, you know what? Um, you you've watched the Pokemon movies, right? Some of them. Uh, the fourth one with Celebi. Yes, I have seen that. Okay, the the there's a a guy now. I don't think he was ever named. But he's basically like a Pokemon bounty hunter. Remember him? Get the motorcycle. Faint. He's trying and he tries to catch Celebi, and he's the. He tries to catch Selby like in the past, and he and he misses. So then, in the present time, the the bad guy—I don't remember his name—goes to him and takes his Tyranitar and turns it into a Dark Tyranitar. Anyway, I want to be a Pokemon bounty hunter. Really I want to be a Pokemon okay. bounty hunter. That's basically what I'm getting at. You do that. Follow your dreams. Make your dreams come true. <laughs>